Hello, this is Clara Rockmore. I'm speaking to you, delighted to have the opportunity to tell you how delighted and happy I am that the work of this wonderful man continues to be, to be not only used, but loved and continued. And I wish you, we give you my blessings to continue in the same way. It is wonderful for me to know towards the end of my life that this will continue. This is the easiest thing that you asked me to do. It gives me true joy to be able to address a group of people so sincerely interested in the theremin, the instrument that I gave my life to, and to know that I'm speaking to living people who continue to love and, and, and respect the, not only the, the Termen himself, but what he put into this world, this ter terrific electronic achievement. Okay, I'm in the home of Clara Rockmore on West 57th Street in New York City. Today is July 9th, 1997, and she's going to uh, give us an instructional tape about how to play the theremin and her random thoughts about the theremin, about the value of the music that we play on the theremin, how to play it properly, produce beautiful tone. So here's Clara. Hello Clara, how are you today? Good evening, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to people personally. Excellent. Well, let's say that I'm a beginning thereminist, and as you know I am a beginning thereminist. What guidance would you give me? The guidance I give you is, first of all, don't expect a miracle. Don't expect to go over to the instrument and you know how to play it. It was Professor Termen himself who told me that he regrets so much that I didn't become an engineer because he said, with your knowledge of engineering and your musical sensitivity, that's when we would have this solved. Without you, it cannot be solved. You are the one who knows much more than all the engineers put together. Well, certainly, without your help, he wouldn't have been able to get the instrument to sound the way your special. No, because he, he gives me all the credit that it was my ear that, that chose that one moment of truth, the one moment when it rings right. It took some doing to it do that. It took some doing to do that. Yes. But, it, it, but you made a great team. But, but, but it's in existence. But do you think it's better to have the engineers be engineers and the musicians work with the engineers to get the sound correct? I think it is important to combine. I think it's important to do it all. You cannot separate things. You cannot say, I know a little of this, but not a little of that. Termen recognized in me the knowledge of an engineer with the sensitivity of a musician. I think that's the key for success with building a theremin. It, it sounds very arrogant, but it happens yeah. to be the truth. I make my living making piano sound beautiful. As you know, I know how to make I your know, piano sound beautiful. I know, I know. But I can't play the theremin. Well, it, it's not that easy. People expect to go over to it and I give them the, open the door, sesame, and it plays. No. It takes hard work, sensitivity, sensibility. Uh, you don't learn how to play the violin overnight. You don't learn how to play any piano overnight. Don't expect to just go over and hibba-jibba or whatever these words are, uh, magic. Mm. It's not magic. It's a lot of sensitivity, a lot of hard work, a, a, a lot of attention to detail. Mm. You yeah. have to learn it. You have to learn it. You have. It's blood and water. It's not easy. So even if one develops a technique to play the theremin proficiently, that does not make him no, or her a musician. No, not at all. The music comes from Not where? at all. From The music comes from the heart, from the mind, from the knowledge of years and years and years of study of music. Of course, no one of us ever expects to duplicate your sound. You've often said that you wish there would be Clara Rockmore yes, coming up I in the do. world. Yes, I do. I would be delighted to have the whole world play as well as I do, but they don't. But they don't, but I think no? that's your musical heritage. You came from a time and from a professor, Professor Auer. Exactly. Speak about Professor Auer. I was four man. years old when I met. Pe people don't realize that. When I was met Professor Auer, the great Auer, 
I was exactly four years old. And the circumstance of my examination, so-called in quotes, is known history. Nobody was allowed, because nobody expected the baby to come, nobody was allowed to enter the door of Professor Auer's examination room with somebody else accompanying them or present. Nobody. Well, I was four years old. So when it came the moment for me to come in on my own, I could only drag my, my violin in its little original red case on the floor. I just dragged it in to the, to the, the examination room because I could not lift it. And when the, the big uh, wheels, the examiner uh, committee, saw this apparition coming on the floor with this the new pupil of Professor Auer. The baby. Uh, but the baby, an infant. They, they picked me up bodily. They put me on top of their table. They had a tremendous table that you have in, in uh, w w where do you have those big tables? like And in a conference room. A conference room, that's right, a long table. They put me on top of that. And that's where I had my ex so-called examination. And that's where I got a mutual Chitiris Prusum 4 plus, the highest mark that they could give me. So you became his youngest pupil? Absolutely, the youngest ever in existence in the, in the, in the history of the, of the conservatory. You of told Russia. me you remembered watching uh, Yasha Heifetz? Yasha Heifetz was, was one of the students, the, uh, and I met him, uh, and he, he was. He was uh, I would say obsequious and very proud to meet me. Uh -huh. he was a little, he, but he was a young boy at that yes, time. He was still in the Yes, knee and pants. still had, I think, curls or something. <laughs> I go a long way. It's, it's very difficult for anybody to yeah. believe it or, or imagine. Oh, I don't think so. No. But after the Russian Revolution, life changed for your family. It became much well, more I, difficult. I, the thing is that we were different from everybody else because we did everything legitimately. We never ran away from Russia. We never went away, hid this. We were permitted officially to live, leave Russia mm -hmm. because of, you know what? No. A simple thing that I did as a child of six, I played for the or orphanage of one of the main cheeses, main councils mm -hmm. in the Soviet government. I played as a child at, at their concert. And as a grateful gesture back, it was given completely official permission for me and my family to leave Russia. Wonderful. So we never, never stole our way away. We left legitimately and officially with permission of the government. That's a beautiful story. I'm going to pause That's, for just one moment. It's a tr I think I'm the only case of, of people leaving Russia completely legitimately uh -huh. with blessings and gratitude well, to my whole family. Your mother and father brought the whole family to New York City in we 1922. We came together. In 1922. Together, we came together and complete permission and blessings of the Soviet Union. But you were only eight years old, nine years old, and you were already a performing musician, a professional yes, I musician. Yes, since I was four. And so was your sister Nadia. Yes. And immediately you played concerts? Absolutely. All our life we played concerts. All our life. I don't know of a life that doesn't have concerts. Now the curious thing to me is that Professor Auer came to New York about the same time, within a year of your arrival. Not only he came to New York, but I was the chosen one. He he took me along with him like you would take a, 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 the, a, the most beloved doll, where he went, went, I went to. So he took me personally. Now this is something to be remembered, to the debut of Yehudi Menuhin, when he played his debut concert in New York, Yehudi Menuhin. It was Professor Auer who took me by the hand with him to Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. We went backstage where nobody else was permitted. And there we found, we found him busily play, practicing a passage. Manukin was 
busily practicing a passage on the violin. And all the Professor Hours said then in my presence, too late, too late. <laughs> and meaning too late is if you don't have that in your body by now, in your soul, it's too late to try to learn the passage now. Yeah. So these were his words. Mm -hmm. These were his words, and he had me by his hand. And it was Professor Auer who took me backstage Carnegie Hall but thousands of years ago. And everything we did was completely open and honest and above board. We stole nothing from anybody. Now, you were soon a student at the Curtis Institute. Mm -hmm. Is this, were you a student at the Curtis Institute? Uh, let me uh, try to... To, uh, to organize my thoughts as to when, uh, mm. when was the K Curtis? Well, I don't know. You can. I you think can I think that the, I think there was a period, yes, where Professor Auer was teaching at the Curtis. He was engaged and ah. asked to teach there. Oops, hold uh, this. Hold this one moment. I have to stop the feed. Okay. Continue? Yes. Sorry. Yes. And who do you think he took with him wherever he moved? Me. <laughs> so you've, you got to see many famous violinists of that period. Absolutely. I was, I was his, his living doll. I mean, yeah. where he went, I went. In that day and age, violinists were even more individualistic than they are yes. today. Yes. And of course, you had your own sound. Yes. Did you learn some of your musical taste from Professor Auer, or did he merely develop what was inborn in your No, soul? I think was inborn and, and greatly helped by my wonderful sister, Nadia, who was music herself, the pianist. Yeah. And we were like one, 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 one soul, one body, one set of ears. You told me once that Nadia had been chosen to perform a, a, a concert debut of a piece by Paderewski. A, a yes, concerto. that that was so was long ago. It's hard for me to remember well, when. Well, you were a little girl. Yes, but she was. She, she did, did that right here. She in New York did City. that right here in New York. But she City. was a, like you. She was a top drawer she artist. She was absolutely top drawer. Not like me. She was. I would put her b above me. Uh, and the only reason she stopped performing actively was because she wanted to have a family and she wanted to teach, but she wanted to devote time to her children. I I can't. Uh, I can't. Uh, detail for you. No, it's it's uh, too long a life to uh, tell you this happened then, that happened here. Take well, it, you, take the whole would thing. Would you like to just speak of things at random that come to your mind? Things you might want to tell a beginning theremin player. Oh, how do, how do we approach the instrument? How do we uh, how do we finger in the air the notes? Before you finger the notes, before you do anything, have music in your soul. If you have music in your soul, you'll find a means to do it. You'll find a way to do it. You but, have to know where you want to go. But you have to know where you want to go. Exactly. That's the word. You <laughs> have to know what you are aiming for. Yeah. What, what are your goals? Are your goals mm -hmm. to be famous? That's easy. It is? Of course. What's there to being famous? You're famous when you sneeze. <laughs> in my in my <laughs> life. Well, this is easy for Clara Rockmore to say. All right, I but don't... I can't separate myself from myself. No, you can't. I'm me. No. I'm me, like it or not, I'm me, and I remain me, and I don't change around to suit the style. Of course not. Let them suit their style yeah. to me. Well, I'm getting arrogant now because I, I, I don't have that much time to live, so I'm not going to waste my time. Of course not. No. In the early 1930s, you began to play the theremin because something happened to your shoulder? My arm, yes, it was a great tragedy. And that's where Termen uh, saved my musical sanity by, by giving me an outlet in music. And he provided you with the first theremin? Yes, absolutely. He built it for me himself. The very first one. The, the very first one. Yes, because yeah. I looked at it. It is special yes, inside. Yes, it yes. It has his touch inside. Yes, he built it for me with his own hands. So you began to play professionally on the theremin now. This is in early 1930s, and you played concerts, you played recitals with Nadia. I played, I played uh, first in Maine, I remember when I was maybe 13 or something. Uh -huh. That was the very first very important remembrance, 
uh, Joseph Hoffman was a magnificent uh, um, person in understanding electronics and uh, long before it became known generally. He, he was one of the top pianists he was, of the day. Uh, he was one of the, the almost top artists and pianists. Uh, and a wonderful man who uh, uh, sounds like a bad record, but he adored me. Everybody seems to have adored me. But I was probably adorable. I was so tiny and knew everything. So he, he was very much uh, on my side. And he took me to, to the first concert of Yehudi Menuchen. Now, you are too young, probably, to remember when that happened. You know who you who you yes. we were, He took me backstage in Carnegie Hall by the hand. He took me, the little me. And we came there, and I remember as if it were today, that there we found the Minuchin busily praying a pa passage, you know, mm -hmm. busily. And all that Professor Auer said to him, too late, too late. <laughs> and what he meant was, if, if you don't know it backwards by now, it won't help you now right. to practice. It's too late to well, practice. Well, when you made your debut performance and Joseph Hoffman was in the audience, you were sharing a that concert. That was in Maine. Yes, and you were sharing a concert building with uh, Shura Cherkasky. Shura Cherkasky was the, 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 the most wonderful pianist at that time, the prize pupil of Joseph Hoffman. But what happened after you played? He completely ignored his prized pupil. He paid no attention to him. He had so much, he was a magnificent uh, uh, person, uh, besides being a musician, in, in, in understanding electronics. So he completely ignored his prized pupil. He ignored the situation. Bodily, he climbed up on the stage, bodily. He, he walked, not walked, really climbed up on the stage mm -hmm. and immediately began to, to plan that the motion of her hands is so beautiful that it is a pity to hide it under the instrument being high. Yeah. So the instrument has to be built much lower so to expose the beauty of the movement of the hands. Right. Your instrument is only <coughs> 42 inches tall. It's much less tall than well, an RCA. Well, whatever, I don't go around yeah. measuring, but you, you, you get the idea. It's much different the, the, That's That's how, how it was, uh, that he completely ignored his mm. own prized pupil, giving that Im yeah. all-important concert because he felt something more important was going on here. Yeah. And he wanted it to be known that this this can be done properly and he wanted it lowered physically to a point to expose the beauty of the hands b working in the air yeah. to show what the hands can do and he was so excited by it that at that particular uh, talking about joseph hoffman yeah. and you've become tired so we'll stop interviewing uh, what shall I do with this tape? May I share it with my yes, friends? Yes, what I want you to do with the tape is it's all given from me with my whole heart for use for people. It's not to be reserved like a museum piece. I want it to be put into use. I want people to be able to, to benefit by it, to play, to do something further and to help other people. It's all free, 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 free. No price is expected and no money and no compensation uh, is expected except to benefit people who will have the sensitivity to listen to it. I think we all thank you for that. It's a great gift. Well, all I, right. I hope that you use it and, and uh, benefit by it. Well, your words will always be an inspiration to those of us who hear them. I, I so hope so. I hope so. It's all given with my full heart. I want to leave something tangibly good to follow in my footsteps. Uh, I have some space on this side of the tape, so I'll go back now to June 12th when I uh, visited Clara the first time on this trip, and uh, she gave me permission to go turn on the, the theremin in the living room. I wanted to make a, a recording of its sound, and. 
uh, without any warm-up and not being able to really play the theremin, I tried my best. And you'll hear Clara making uh, comments in the background. She, she was having a good time, as was I. Uh, but I was a little bit nervous. Well, I hope I have it set correctly. Okay, I'll try it. Uh, I want to see how the range compared yes, with yes, mine. Yes, was the voice of Betty Baldwin, Mrs. Rockmore's friend and companion for the last ten years. Clara's theremin had not been switched on in over a year, so it was really exciting to hear it come to life once again. This instrument has a tone quality. Um, it gives a visceral feel that simply can't be duplicated on a cassette tape. You have to be there in person. It's a wonderful sounding instrument. It's almost as wonderful as spending an afternoon with Clara Rockmore. 